Turn with me in your copy of God's Holy Word, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. I began my first Sunday here with you preaching on the name of Jesus. And I want to close out my section with you talking about the life of Jesus. Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Now, your interim pastor is coming. He's going to share a devotional tonight. Dr. Larry Purcell is a dear friend of mine. He has taught in seminary under the uh, category of leadership in, in two different seminaries. And um, just an amazing man. You will really love Dr. Larry Purcell, and he'll do great things. I pledge to you my continued prayers for the days ahead, and I, I hope you'll pray for me as well. But I believe the best days of Paducah First Baptist Church are the days just in the future. God is going to do a great thing in you and among you and through this church. Well, stand with me for the reading of God's holy word, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, Magi, or wise men, from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And Lord, teach us this, your holy word. Teach us from your word about Jesus today. And may he be more and more in our lives until we get to go be with him forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. If I asked you who was the Son of God, what would you say? Jesus. If I asked you what this Bible is all about, what would you say? Jesus. Old Testament looks forward to his coming. New Testament tells about his coming. And um, if uh, I ask you what life is all about, what would you say? Jesus. If I ask you what was the key to your eternity, your answer would be Jesus. How is your life fulfilled? The answer, Jesus. Who gives peace and purpose and joy? Your answer would be Jesus. I saw a t-shirt that a lady had on one day, large letters. It said, it's all about Jesus. And I think that's right. So if it's all about Jesus, this life and the life to come, would you be okay if I took a few minutes and just gave you a survey of the life of Jesus? Is that okay? Thank you, because that's what I plan to do today, so... <laughs> Charles Dickens wrote a book years ago called a, a Tale of Two Cities. You might remember it begins with that memorable line, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It's like when you go on a trip, the best of times, and then stop at a gas station, the worst of times. <laughs> it was the best of times, the worst of times. And um, the title of the book is A Tale of Two Cities. I think we can talk about Jesus in the aspect of a tale of four cities. And that first city is on your outline would be Bethlehem, Bethlehem. You see, Isaiah said in chapter 7 that Jesus, the Messiah, would be born of a virgin. Nobody had ever been born of a virgin before or since. But Jesus was. Jesus was. And then he tells us in in Isaiah chapter 9, all of this 800 years before Jesus came, he tells us his name would be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, and Prince of Peace. And then when you look at the book of Micah, Micah tells us where he would be born. 
He's going to be born in Bethlehem. So we've got from the Old Testament, here's a, a, a virgin-born child who's going to be the Son of God and a mighty counselor, the Prince of Peace. And from Micah, that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And sure enough, he was born in Bethlehem. Now, it came about under odd circumstances. We looked at some of that a little earlier uh, when we looked at the book of Ruth. You remember Naomi and her family were in Moab and came back with um, Ruth. And uh, they came back to Bethlehem, just Naomi and Ruth. And Ruth married Boaz through a series of providential events. And they had a child named Obed, and Obed had a child named Jesse, and Jesse had seven sons, and the youngest of those seven sons was named David. And David became the, the best king Israel had ever had. Governed the widest area Israel ever governed. King David. And it was prophesied in the Old Testament that it would be a, like a lineage of his. Lineage of David would last forever. Joseph, Jesus' stepfather, was of the lineage of David. And it just so happened providentially that uh, Quirinius, a ruler of Rome, required all of the citizens in all of the vast Roman Empire to go to their ancestral homes to be taxed. And so Joseph had to mount his um, engaged wife on a donkey. It was before they had come together. Back then, though, engagement was broken only by divorce. It was very serious. And they had to go to Bethlehem. Can you imagine her traveling those three days by donkey, about to give birth at any time? They arrive in Bethlehem, and all of the hotel rooms are taken there. Bethlehem's just a small place, and, uh, or it was then. It's 50,000 now. But um, there was no room for them in the inn, and so they had to be born. The baby had to be born in a stable. The stable was actually in a cave, which was common in that day to keep animals in a cave. Today, there's a church built over that cave, the Church of the Nativity. And um, it is the oldest church, so, uh, oldest um, continuous church building in Christendom. And it is because the Persians, when they came into um, the land of Judea, destroyed all of the Christian churches except this one. Because in Bethlehem, they had pictures drawn of the wise men who came from Persia. And so they didn't destroy that building because they had pictures of their countrymen who had come there all that thousand or hundreds of years before. Well, Bethlehem, the baby was born there in, in a cave. Now, he wasn't born in a palace so that some could say, he's too good for me. He was born in a cave. And the first ones that heard about Jesus being born, the Messiah coming, were working men out in the field. Not the rulers of government, not the rulers of business, but working men out in the field. The shepherds heard. And, and perhaps that was the same field that Boaz had planted years earlier. And the, they came and worshiped Jesus there in Bethlehem. Well, a little later, he came on up a ways, but from a thousand miles away from Persia or Iran, there came the wise men, the magi. They were astrologers and wise in many other ways. They saw a star, very unusual. They kept very much in touch with the heavens. And they saw a star and followed it to uh, Israel. But it, the, you know, you can look in the sky, but you can't tell exactly where to go, just a general area. And so they went to Jerusalem and asked where the Christ was who had been born. <laughs> well, so King Herod began to inquire, who is this Christ? Where is he born? They looked it up in the scriptures, the chief priests, they said, Micah says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And so Herod decreed that all of the boy babies in Bethlehem, two years old and under, now remember it's a thousand miles from, from Persia on over and there weren't as good roads then as there are now. So Jesus by this time was probably a toddler and they were probably living in a rental house. 
there in Bethlehem. So he decreed that all the, the boy babies, two years old and under, would be killed there. But you can't thwart the plans of God. God told Joseph in a dream, get up and get your family ready and get on down to Egypt because Herod's going to kill all the babies here. And so he did. He got his family ready. Undoubtedly, they headed out that very night. The next day or maybe two days later, the soldiers came, but Jesus and his family were long gone. They were way on their way down to Egypt. They lived there a while, and God appeared to him in a dream again and said, Herod is dead now. You can go back. But on his way back, he found out that Herod's son, Herod's son Archelaus, was now the ruler over Judea. And so he still felt it wasn't safe to go back to Bethlehem, and so they went back to their original hometown of Nazareth, 90 miles further north in Galilee. And that's the second. That's the second. By the way, when the wise men came, I heard about a teacher that asked her Sunday school class to draw pictures of the nativity. You want to hear this, don't you? And uh, one little boy drew the, there was Mary, there was Joseph, there was the baby, there were the sheep, there were the, the shepherds who had come. And then he had some firemen. And she said, I understand Joseph and Mary and the baby, but why you got these firemen? He said, well, the Bible says they came from afar. <laughs> the first city, the city of Bethlehem. The second city, the city of Nazareth. Now, this also was in fulfillment of the Old Testament because the Old Testament word, Nazar, is the word branch. And the Old Testament prophesied that Jesus would be from the branch of David. And following through his stepfather, Joseph, he came from the branch of David. And uh, so there he was in, in Nazareth. Now, think about it. Jesus lived, probably died at age 33. If he went to Nazareth, say around age four, we don't know exactly how old he was, maybe three or four. But he lived there till he was 30. He lived over 80% of his life in Nazareth. What, did, what, did, what was it like there in Nazareth for Jewish boys growing up? Well, first, Nazareth was a small town like Bethlehem had been. 500 people or less. We know that because they only had one water well, and that was about all that a water well could sustain, about 500 people. And uh, when the people there gathered, they had a lot of things in common. For instance, all of the farmers that grew grapes wouldn't each one have a grape press. They would have one that the whole community would use. You can go to Nazareth today and go to a place called Nazareth Village and you can see cut into the side of a cliff a grape press from many years ago the, during the days when Jesus would have been there. The cliff rises up maybe 30 feet and about 10 feet off, the, off of the floor is um, a, a level place along the cliff where a, sort of a bowl has been cut out. Not deep, maybe this deep. And then a, a hole through the end of the bowl so that the juice could drain. And that's where they would put the grapes. And then it was the children who would step on the grapes to mash the juice out. How fun would that have been as a child? Can't you see Jesus and the other children holding it? it Adults couldn't do it because when they stepped on the grapes, they would crush the seeds. The seeds were bitter and you couldn't have the seeds. So it had to be children. And here they were. Can't you see Jesus stepping on the grapes with his uh, grape-colored legs up to his, his knees and children slipping down in it and falling and having grape juice all over them? They had a little, um, a little valley cut through the edge of the, uh, this little bowl and down at the bottom of it was a place they could collect the juice that poured. And can't you see Jesus and the others? That was there in Nazareth. He grew up just like any other child would. In fact, the Bible says he grew in wisdom 
and in grace. He, he grew. <clears throat> and that tells me that Jesus, some of his powers were limited when, we, when he came from heaven. He didn't have all of the powers that he had in heaven. Some of them were limited so that he could fully understand how it was to be a person. And he grew up there in Nazareth. Now, what was it like for a boy growing up in, in Nazareth or in all of Judea? Well, Jewish boys, half of the day went to school, and the other half of the day, they worked with their dads to learn a trade. In fact, uh, a Jewish historian said, any parent that doesn't teach his child a trade teaches his child to steal. And so they would learn a trade. Now, what trade was Joseph? He was a carpenter, that's right. In the Greek, the word is tecton, and the tectons work with wood, but they also work with stone. Um, and in that day, he probably worked with stone more than wood because it was a lot more common. The very, um, the very place where Jesus was laid when he was first born was probably a a feeding trough, but it probably wasn't wood. It was a stone trough. There, there are stone troughs like that in Megiddo and other places you can see today. Well, Jesus would have worked half his day with his dad. Now, where did his dad work? Work wasn't real common in that day, but it just so happened again under the providence of God that the ruler in Galilee, who was another of Herod's sons, decided to build a capital city, Sephorus, two miles away from Bethlehem. Now Jesus undoubtedly went to Sephorus to work with his dad in building that city. I've never read this anywhere in commentary, so I'm just supposing some of this. But I believe this is true. Think about it, going two miles to work with his father and learning the trade of carpentry and, and stone masonry. One of Jesus' parables, he says, if a man uh, require, if a soldier requires you to carry his pack one mile, carry it how far? Two. How far was it from Jerusalem to Sephora? Two miles. And the Roman soldiers often traveled that area. Jesus undoubtedly learned Latin as he walked along the road with the Roman soldiers, probably carrying their packs many days. And he carried them both miles without complaint. <laughs> Amazing. Now, he worked with his father there, but on the other half of the day, he learned the Jewish history. And the rabbis would have taken him up on Mount Precipice where you can see for miles around. You can see almost to the, um, the Sea of Galilee. It's just on the other side of a mountain. You can see Mount Gilboa where Saul and Jonathan were killed. You can look the other way and see the uh, mount uh, beside which the city of Cain is located where Jesus later on uh, raised up a man, a widow's son, from the dead. You can look and see the roads where Elisha and Elijah walked. All of that visible from Nazareth. Jesus learned his Jewish history right there in a place where you could see it all. But the thing perhaps most importantly you could see from Nazareth was the valley of Megiddo. The word for valley in Hebrew is har. So Har Megiddo, or what Revelation calls Armageddon. The great last battle of history is going to happen on a plain where Jesus grew up looking over that plain, the battle of Armageddon. And Jesus learned all of that in Nazareth. We also know that he taught in the synagogue there occasionally. When he was age 12, they took him down to the temple, as they often did. It was his bar mitzvah and um, uh, his uh, commitment to be a son of the covenant. But he probably traveled to Jerusalem every year. He astounded the, the uh, rabbis with his knowledge, even at age 12. And, of course, he continued to grow. And then later on, 
His first miracle was performed while he was still in Nazareth. Remember where it was? It was in a city called Cana of Galilee. Now, Cana was a nearby town to Nazareth. Jesus and his family went there. But when he went there, they ran out of wine. Now, they had a weak wine in that day. It, it, it was a fermented juice. But it, it was necessary for them because they had no refrigeration, of course. And the grape juice would be a low fermented, fermented wine. And so they ran out of it. And his mother told him. Jesus told the servants to get the water jars, which are uh, preparatory for the Jewish people before they entered the house to dip their hands into the jar. Those jars would have held 20 to 30 gallons each told his servants to take the jars and fill them with water. They filled them with water, and when they got back, the hostess of the wedding event said it was the best wine ever. He said most people serve their best first, and then when people can't tell the difference, they serve the the, uh, lesser wines, but you've saved the best for last. Jesus made wine his first miracle. But notice, it was at a wedding. And Jesus is still in the process of performing miracles in marriages today. I mean, you think about it. Here's a lady that grows up under her mom and dad. They have one way of living. Here's a husband that grows up under his mom and dad. They have another way of living. Then you put those two together and you think it's happy ever after? Well, it may be happy, but it's not ever after. There's a lot of struggle to get to that happy ever after. It's not 50-50, it's 100-100% giving to one another, isn't it, to make it happy ever after. He's still in the process of performing miracles in marriage today. Now, one other thing about Nazareth. Joseph is never mentioned after Jesus was at age 12. Most scholars believe he died. Not when Jesus was 12, but probably a little after that, maybe when he was 15, maybe when he was 20 or 22. We don't know. But who would be in charge of the family after Joseph died? It would be the oldest son in the family. Now, Jesus waited until he was 30 years old to start his ministry as a rabbi. Why did he wait till he was 30? He had to take care of his brothers and sisters and make sure they were provided for until he was 30, till they got on up where they could take care of themselves. And just think of it. If that's the truth, and I believe it is, then God ordained that the salvation of the world would be delayed until the family was taken care of. Now, what does that say about the importance of the family in the eyes of Almighty God? Mm. First city, city of Bethlehem. Second city, city of Nazareth. The third city, the city of Capernaum. Capernaum was a seacoast town on the, on the northern edge of Galilee. Now, Nazareth is 450 feet above sea level, 451. And uh, Capernaum is 900 feet below sea level on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. So, a huge drop. But right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee is this fishing village of Capernaum. Peter lived there, as did other fishermen. Peter apparently had done really well in fishing because he had a large house, much larger than most of the others. His was an octagonal-shaped house, eight-sided house. In Mark's gospel, Jesus made his his, uh, home base, Peter's home there in Nazareth, in um, Capernaum. And... um, In Mark's gospel, it says one time that they left Peter's house and immediately were at the synagogue. I've stepped off from the back of the excavated house of Peter 
to the foundations of the ancient synagogue is 37 steps. No wonder he could say immediately, it was right at the back door. And the, the front door faced the Sea of Galilee, right on the sea, I mean right on the edge. How neat it was growing up there. And most of Jesus' ministry took place right there. In fact, if you went from Capernaum and traveled a few miles over to the Mount of Beatitudes where Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount, and you stretched out your left hand to cover Capernaum, standing on that mount looking down, and your right hand over to the southern edge of the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long, 8 miles across. And you, you stretched out your right hand to cover the southern edge, and you covered the, ter the land along the edge, both sides, you would cover 60% of our Gospels. You'd hold that within your hand, 60%. Took place right there. It's where Jesus walked on water on the Sea of Galilee. Now, Sandy and I have also walked on water on the Sea of Galilee. Now, we had a boat under us, but <laughs> hey, you know, you gotta, gotta make the best you can make. So, the Sea of Galilee. It's where Jesus stilled the storm. The disciples woke up. The storm was about to overcome them. He said, don't you remember what happened when I fed the 5,000 and the 4,000? That should have proven that he was the Son of God and he was able to control uh, um, uh, history and nature and society. And so he just said, hush. And literally, it would be, be muzzled, he said, to the wind. And it died down just like that. And the, the sea was calm and peaceful. I've seen it when it, you, you could just, out in the middle of it was just hardly a wave. And yet the Sea of Galilee was such that the wind would come off Mount Hermon uh, 40 miles to the north or from the uh, Mediterranean Sea 30 miles to the west. And it would come and drop down into that bold 900 feet below sea level, and storms would work up very, very quickly, as they did several times when Jesus was there. It was at there, it was at that place where Jesus called his first disciples. It was there where Jesus said to Peter, cast your net on the other side. And they pulled up such a great catch of fish. It was at Capernaum where Jesus did many miracles. For instance, the lady with the flow of blood which, who touched his, the hem of his garment was healed there. And Jairus' daughter, Jairus, one of the rulers of the synagogue, asked Jesus to come to his house. And when Jesus got there, they said it's too late. The, the flute players who customarily come to funerals in, in that time, were, they were already playing. And, the, and Jesus said, clear everybody out. They said, Why? He said, just do it. They did. Jesus went upstairs to where she was laying, and he said the words, Talitha kumi. Talitha is the word, the feminine word for the word talit, which is the prayer shawl. And literally what he said was, prayer shawl, get up. And when he said that, that prayer shawl began rising. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there and seen it? And the girl underneath rose up with it. And she was made whole again. Jesus raised her from the dead. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen that? It was when he was in Nazareth that he fed the 5,000. It was when he was in Nazareth that he went to the other side and cast the demons out of Legion who lived in the caves. It was when he was in Nazareth, excuse me, in Capernaum, that he went to, um, went across to Tyre and Sidon, or that he went north and he went to uh, Caesarea Philippi or to the Mount of Transfiguration on Mount Hermon. All of that happened there in Capernaum. So we've covered three cities, the city of Bethlehem, the city of Nazareth, and the city of Capernaum. Now, there's a fourth city, the city of Jerusalem. And when Jesus went to Jerusalem for the last time, Wonderful things happened. He cleansed the temple. He performed two miracles. There are only two in Jerusalem. He healed a blind man at the pool of Siloam. 
and he healed a paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda. Very interesting that he chose those two miracles because when David, King David, Jesus' predecessor, went to Jerusalem a thousand years earlier, the Jebusites still controlled that city. And they told David, even the blind and the lame can keep you out. Of course, they didn't. And he overcame the city. When Jesus came, he healed the blind and the lame. (laughs) When he healed the lame man at the Pool of Bethesda, it was right beside the temple of Asclepius, which was the ancient god of healing. But the man had lain there by the pool 30 some odd years and hadn't been healed until the Prince of Peace, the great physician, said, get up and walk, and he did. Yes, and he's still healing people today. I have an idea. When we get to heaven, we're going to find out all of those times when we almost died earlier, but we offered a prayer, and God healed us. Yes, he's still in the process of doing so today. He went to Jerusalem. There he had the disciples to prepare an upper room. There he gave his last Lord's Supper. There he and the disciples went to the Mount of Olives just just beyond the valley and overlooking the great eastern wall. There in that Garden of Gethsemane, Judas betrayed him with a kiss and they captured him and took him to to the home of the high priest. And there in that home, he was beaten and questioned and, and tricked. They tried to trick him, but of course he wouldn't allow it. Are you the son of man? Are you the Messiah? Jesus answered, it is as you say. They beat him covered his face, and the guards beat him. They put him into a cistern, dropped down about 12 feet. At that time, it only had one opening. They had to lower him in it. And for perhaps hours, he sat there in that opening, knowing that the next day he would be crucified. No one around him, no one with him, only the Holy Spirit alone to comfort him. The next day, they pulled him out. They sent him to Pilate. He was again questioned, what is truth, Pilate said. Jesus had already taught, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Pilate wanted to free him. His wife had said, have nothing to do with this man, he's innocent. And Pilate said he's innocent, and yet he gave in to the wishes of the people and allowed him to be crucified. They took him to a place of a skull. After the soldiers beat him mercilessly, on the lithostratus, the the striated road there in Jerusalem, in the bottom of Antonio's fortress, they beat him. If you've seen the Passion of the Christ, it's pretty accurate, that part of it is. And even though he was beaten senseless almost, he, he had to bear his cross beam, and he went as far as he could, And then they forced Simon of Cyrene to carry it the rest of the way to the place of the skull. There's a cliff just outside of Jerusalem that looks like a skull. And there, publicly, he was crucified with the title above him, the King of the Jews. And your Lord and mine didn't have to die there, but he did. He died there to take my sins away and to take yours away so that we wouldn't have to have them anymore. They buried him, and three days later, he rose from the dead. From the dead. On Friday, death entered the tomb. On Sunday morning, life emerged. And then he appeared to his disciples 12 different times to his followers he appeared. The last one was when he was on the Mount of Olives and he rose up in the sky. And I can just hear him as he rises higher, be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And then as he got higher in Judea. And then as he got higher in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. 
the fourth city, the city of Jerusalem. But one more thing I want to share with you, not in your outline today. It's the fifth city. That's the city of your heart. Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus wants to make a home in our hearts. And that's the most important thing. I mean, think of it. All of this other stuff took place 2,000 years ago. Can it really make a difference in our lives today? Absolutely. If we receive Jesus as our Savior, He comes to live in our hearts. I have a little story here. Y'all enjoy humor, don't you? And and that's the reason I, I want to read this last one. Children have such a wonderful way of expressing themselves. When asked to write an essay on anatomy, one youngster wrote the following. Your head is kind, of, is kind of round and hard, and your brains is in it, and your hair is on it. Your face is on the front of your head where you eat and make faces. Your neck is what keeps your head out of your collar. It's hard to keep clean. Your stomach is something if you don't eat often enough, it hurts, and spinach don't help none. Your spine is a long bone in your back that keeps you from folding up. Your back is always behind you no matter how quick you turn. Your arms you got to pitch with and so you can reach the butter. Your fingers stick out of your hands. Your legs get you to first base. Your feet are what you run on and your toes are what always get stubbed. And that's all there is on you except what's inside and I ain't seen that. But you got to give it to the boy. At least he knew there was something on the inside. And that's why I'm sharing with you about Jesus. It's not just what he did the 2,000 years ago. It's what he's still doing on the inside. Do you have Jesus on the inside? Would you say amen? Amen. Do you have Jesus on the inside? Would you say amen? amen? It's the fifth city that matters. Jesus living within. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord. You're so good to us. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for for, uh, keeping us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be your children, for teaching us how to live in righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for preparing us a home in heaven. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to come again one day and receive us to yourself. And now, Lord, work your will in this invitation. We ask it in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.